So I am looking forward to presenting to all of you. And I found out that this is a very large audience that goes beyond Marin. I'm I'm based in Marin. So some of the photos and things are based on in Marin, but um, I've also lived in Contra Costa County and other counties. So I, I know that you can find applicable information. Um, so anyway, I also like to start with um, a little story. And so um, my first slide is a picture of actually one of my neighbor's property who, who lives there now. Uh, it was a property that was developed in 1944 on a hill um, above Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. So if any of you know that area, uh, you know that it's very, they're very steep hills. And if you can imagine how much labor went into forming and pouring this concrete as it stepped down the hills, um, and this was before pumping rigs and other ways of develop, uh, delivering concrete by hose. You can imagine how, what a noble achievement this was. Um, and um, I, I had a note that it was uh, 10 tons of concrete per wall, 20,000 pounds. So at 100 pounds per trip, uh, Vincent, who made this, would make 200 trips to fill the forms for just one wall. So be grateful we have uh, new equipment these days. Here is a, another solution that could be used on a hillside. And it's uh, employing an entirely different technique using steel containers that you can commercially buy. They're very expensive depending on the size uh, and whether they're custom or not. They can run easily into a thousand or two thousand dollars per container. But because they're steel, they rust and they turn this really lovely um, patina, which the designer coordinated it with the, the, the wood and also you can see the plants in here. Um, I am not going to be talking about specific plants too much because it depends so much on where you live and the environmental conditions uh, within the environment that you live in. I know everybody wants their plant list, um, but you have to do the work and you have resources at SLOAT who can help you do this work to find out what plants will grow best in your environment. Um, but another thing to think about is, are you landscaping down a hill or are you creating a terracing effect where you have flat surfaces as in this case, uh, where different plants can grow in these different situations. So um, we're, I'm gonna talk more about the structure of hillside landscaping rather than the plants you put on them. So my inspiration this year was uh, all the storms we had on New Year's. Um, and I, I decided, okay, I'm gonna walk around the neighborhood and just see what happened. We were without power, as with many, as were many other people. So um, I found this um, hillside location that had a, a decent retaining wall built on it. But you can see above all this erosion that happened just with one storm. Um, and we'll be talking more about ways that you can control this. Um, but the, the owner of this property, and I, I don't know if you're watching this webinar, but hopefully you'll learn something if you are, but um, they, they did try. They have stairs and they have terracing. So these are the kinds of things that you can do that will stop the erosion at lower levels. And again, remember, it's important whether you live at the top of the hill or the bottom of the hill in what you're trying to control and, um, and work with. But um, I can I can tell you that the trees are are the the best insurance against erosion, um, and um, the other thing that's really important to determine whether you're going to need an engineer or not is it's several factors, including the angle of the slope, and where the structures and access points are located on the property. So this this again is a, a street. In, in Fairfax that I walked down, but you can see just from one property to the next, the trees are holding this, this property in place. So if you have trees and, and you can keep them, please do because they, that's what's gonna keep the rest from happening. 
Um, again, just walking around the, 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 the hills of Fairfax, I saw areas like this, which were floodplains, which will not be built on. I mean, I saw the, the um, story poles here once, and they are no longer there because um, where there's substantial hillside drainage, uh, as you can see here, it's not considered suitable for construction sites. But if you own a property that has a uh, drainage path on it, there's lots of stuff you can do to landscape it and make it look beautiful. And I have some slides coming up where you can see a, a wonderful example. So the process that I uh, promote in classes and also in my business is um, collaborating with the earth and following the principles of the watershed approach to landscaping. And what that will accomplish is uh, by following this approach, you will achieve lush, beautiful evergreen gardens requiring less water and conserving natural resources and also creating wonderful habitats for plants and beneficial insects. So, uh, the watershed approach, I'm, I'm going to just go over this briefly so you know what we're talking about. It pays attention to the design and contour of the landscape, and I will be focusing a lot on that today. Um, it also involves building healthy soil and retaining water, rainwater on the property instead of running down the sewers, and choosing climate appropriate plants and additionally managing supplemental irrigation. So those are, those are the components and the program that we offer at College of Marin um, has classes in all of these things. So what is a watershed? In this definition, it's any surface from which runoff results from rainfall and is collected and drained through a common point. And uh, in this diagram on the left, it could be the mountains uh, in Marin County, draining through the pasture lands, down through um, the catchment area, which is down here, and down into the area where people live and into the bay. So all of this collects the materials that the water is running through. So that's why it's important to pay attention to the watershed and what goes in it, and because it, it is our, uh, our future. We are all dealing with climate change. And um, it, as a way to deal with climate change, we are promoting designing your properties as mini watersheds. And with that definition, uh, your roof is a watershed. So as water falls off your roof, down the um, drainage pipes into the landscape, that's where we wanna catch it and deal with it and design landscapes that are truly resilient to the effects of climate change. Now, looking at this um, image on the right, I know some of you are thinking, well, we don't have a river running through our yard, and of course not, but this does not have to be a river that runs all year round. It could be a dry creek bed. And looking at the vegetation and what states state it is in, um, this looks to me like it was taken in the spring. There's some calla lilies up here. There's some grasses that are just starting to grow. So if you create a dry stream look through your property, some of the year, your, your, the water will run down it and create a watershed and water the plants along the way, which are, are um, designed to enjoy the place that they are living. Um, in other words, there's some rushes and grasses that don't mind having their feet wet as long as they have sunshine above them. So um, I'm gonna go a little bit further into designing for rainwater capture, talking about conventional landscapes, with, uh, which is what um, many houses uh, are living on. Um, which consists of a depleted aquifer, compacted soil, uh, surfaces, the water can't penetrate. And um, so what happens is the water comes off the roof, down the drain pipe and into the sewers. It is not staying in the soil and, and, and filling up the aquifer and providing water for the, for the plants the rest of the year. So, the water wise landscape approach is uh, to design 
uh, a property that has permeable pavement, uh, augment the soil so it, it is like a soil sponge and can absorb the water, um, permeable paving, little uh, swales where the water can go instead of straight off the property. Um, and that is the, that's basically the approach to the, the watershed uh, approach to landscaping, keep the water on the property. And how you do that is uh, you basically you slow the water down so that it is more easily absorbed into the earth. And you can do this various ways, rain chains, um, are, there's some beautiful rain chains out now, that's an elegant way to direct water. Um, and then also direct it into um, uh, swales and basins that will water your garden later. And of course, uh, spreading leaf mulch and um, wood pulp through your garden will also slow down the water. You also want to spread it um, so that it doesn't just pool up. And permeable materials for pathways are a great way to do this. This was um, my front yard uh, that I um, replaced with a permeable path and mosaic and um, never looked back. It, it solved so many problems for me. The other component is after slowing it and spreading it, you want it to sink into the ground. So that's where the healthy soil comes into play. And if it, it isn't, you know, if you if it is not just clay that you won't absorb the soil, but it has um, additives that that help create the soil sponge, that will help hold the water on your site. And if you can't design a water that holds garden, be sure that you can create a landscape that it passes through um, more slowly before it goes off your property. Storing the water. Uh, trees also can hold the water in place by slowly releasing it over time. And you can also harvest your rainwater by storing it in rain barrels or cisterns to collect, uh, connected to downspouts. And it can also then be released more slowly into the landscape between winter rains to reduce the effects of flooding and also recharge the water supply. So your yard is a mini watershed and that's how I would like you to think about it. So it, we still have, we have another um, uh, rain event. Uh, what do they call it? The, the atmospheric rivers flowing through the Bay Area again this weekend. So put on your galoshes and walk out and look where the water is going around your property and really note if it's pooling up anywhere and where the erosion is uh, and where it's running off your property. Uh, does it run onto your property from a neighbor or does it run into the street? So note those on a map, locate where all the water is coming onto your property and, um, and I can help you design a landscape to help divert it. One of the best ways is to use um, basins, berms and boulders. So just a quick definition, a basin and a swale, um, they're both shallow channels that um, are six to 24 inches deep, and they move water around over short distances on sloped or flat landscapes. So the berms are the, the earth that you dig up from your swale and mound them on the side, and that helps uh, contain the water and provide better drainage for the plants. The boulders are also used to retain the edges of the swale and to create the dry creek look. Here is a, an example of a swale and a basin. And um, also I want to note that the, um, the in the front here, this is, is kind of the beginning of a rain garden. And uh, rain gardens allow water to permeate the ground, acting as sort of a natural water filter. And they, they're essentially small scale bioretention basins because they slow the flow of water and allow it to percolate into the ground where the plants and the soil uh, microorganisms can break down the organic compounds and remove the pollutants such as phosphorus, nitrogen, and hydrocarbons before they go into the rest of the waterways. So digging a basin, 
these are not cylinder, they're sloping. So um, the diagram on the right shows it pretty well. Um, you can mound extra soil around the bowl to increase the capacity. And you can do this all the way across the hill, a hillside, like make little pocket basins all across the hillside. And that alone will help your plants. If you do nothing else with no irrigation or anything, you just create these little pocket basins that will help you, your plants through the dry seasons. So um, to help them get a good start, put in uh, a little bit of um, compost or worm castings to activate the soil. Building a berm. Um, these are, uh, berms are not symmetrical, they're asymmetrical. So you wanna have a, a little slope going to uh, direct the water, uh, especially if it's in a basin area and you, and you have overflow, you, you wanna direct the overflow out of the basin. And this area is usually planted also, the top of the basin is, is planted and you can have your fill inside um, some kind of substrate um, or, and then your clay soil on top and then a good top soil at the very top. Stones and boulders um, can retain the edges of the, the swale and um, also create wonderful focal points for your garden. And a little landscape trick is to bury them into the soil to give them a more natural look. Don't just plop them on top, give them a little depth. Here's a uh, example of how you can direct the water flow away from downspouts. Here's a water downspout on the right here. Note here, this is uh, most likely just gravel in here, but down here, this, this, I don't know for sure, this could have a French drain in here below this pathway, but this is how you, uh, these are some of the ways that you can keep from water, uh, keep it from pooling up on your property, causing erosion and keep it on your property. So my biggest um, advice is to collaborate with nature when you can. And here is uh, an example of um, a slope and a hillside that um, was landscaped. Um, it wasn't just left to be running down the hill. It was beautifully landscaped. And um, you can see the, the contour planting across the slopes, which helped slow spread and sink the rainwater into the planted area. Um, and these were probably um, shallow mulch filled basins along here. Here is the same property um, showing it from above the driveway and in the summer this is dry, but in the winter it flows under the driveway through a four foot diameter culvert at the top. This, situ this was engineered. This was not a do it yourself job, but it was directed very appropriately uh, into catch basins connected to swales and um, and then allowing this uh, soil to become a giant sponge. Uh, here is an example of how the uh, water was directed away from the house. Um, and you always wanna grade your ditches away from the foundation and locate them um, uh, five to 10 feet away. You don't want any water getting near your foundations and also direct overflow, overflow paths. Uh, I mean, create overflow paths to direct uh, water where you want it to go. So this, this uh, path remains dry um, all year long. Um, note the variety of um, stones to give it a more natural effect along with the pea gravel. And uh, this, this pathway was connected um, to French drains at the low point so that it did not flood. And this, this, is, where, um, this is where the water is collected before it runs under the um, driveway. So slopes and, and hillsides can be um, greatly aided by plants with strong root systems to, that hold the soil in place. And also um, using um, pavers and permeable walkways to contour the access to your garden. Here are, here are a few ideas for stairways. 
And note, um, I mean, there's a lot of ways to um, think about a hillside. You can think about it as a way to follow the contour of the land and design your pathways around the contour as the is the case on the left here. In the case on the right, um, which is also a fine solution and, and a safer one at that because you're building little platforms between the rise after you go up three stairs, there's a platform, then you go down, there's another little platform. This is very safe. But notice there's still, you're not gonna get away from retaining walls. These are all retaining walls going up here along the way. But those retaining walls create little garden beds in between the, the staircase and the wall. And both are beautifully attractive ways to get down or up a hill. Here are some other examples um, in the image on the left. Uh, boulders were used to shape the pathway. And I, I didn't talk about cost, but the, the two versions on the slides be below in, employed stones for the, for the path. And that's a very expensive way to go. This is a less expensive. Um, stones are sold by the ton. So uh, you don't get very many stones if you're getting big boulders like this. So just keep that in mind. Um, this, in the case on the right, it, it follows the, the natural slope of the hill. Um, and just, but also notice the um, retaining wall on the right here. You don't, you cannot get away from building a retaining wall if you're building stairs down a hillside. Here's another approach, the tram, the tramway approach, just straight up. Um, and there are times when this is appropriate. For example, um, if you have a structure to the, the to one side of your pathway and you and the property property line on the other side, you don't have enough room to do a curving path. So you may need to to do a, a, a tramway style path going down the hill. Um, or if you have a very contemporary landscape and and you just want to think about the architecture and don't care about the way the hill looks or the contours, you can just go straight up and do it that way. Terracing is one of my favorite ways of dealing with hillsides. And again, this is my property um, that, so I know it well. It used to have um, a, a uh, probably a six foot retaining wall going all the way across here, which was slowly encroaching on the cars and the driveway. So I decided to, landscape cut into the the wall lowered it down to about three feet which be, by doing that I did not need a permit because it was below the height level for my county um, meaning it didn't require a permit and um, and then I created a um, a, a way of um, I call it Maybeck meets high tech because I use guy wires here cable rails and then I have my um, wisteria on the top. So um, it's, a, it's not a system you can buy. This was, this was all custom. Um, and then I stepped up the, the stairs going up the hill and um, put rocks for the terracing here. So that worked well. Here's some other beautiful ways you can terrace. And um, these are um, uh, in Seattle, Washington very architectural. I love them. I'm just going to show pictures and you can also love them. Here's another beautiful landscape. Um, I believe this is in England. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have the source. But again, dry, dry stacking rocks, cutting into the contours of the land to and employ in using that to create the pathways going through this property. Gorgeous, beautiful. If you have the means, I love it. Um, more dry stack walls, which are beautiful for um, habitats for insects or small animals and rock gardens. And you can also buy rocks that have little um, contours in them to hold water. And this, I, they're like little beaches for um, birds and other insects to access the water. And this does not require um, any kind of fountain system, it's natural. Um, here is another look for retaining walls where it, it is um, incorporating a pathway, boulders, as well as a retaining wall, but it does do this 
I believe very well incorporating it into the natural landscape. My favorite look is where you just use the natural landscape and grasses and um, drought tolerant plants and just um, use that as your um, design for your hillside. Here's a few other examples. Um, everyone has a different kind of yard. So if your yard looks like this and you don't have a big hillside, but you have a little hillside, you can terrace it this way and still have access up here. I love the way this was designed up the hill, little access points to, to get to your gardens and some um, planters at the base. So you have your flat area for planting and then the trees at the top, which will grow and uh, conceal that, that fence eventually. Or uh, stone walls, which of course are beautiful, but more costly. Storage systems. Um, there are wonderful ways to store water. Um, I am not a big fan of some of them, but uh, if you can, if you have a system that that can store water and easily flow uh, flow it down through your landscape, I'm all for that. Here, here's one of my favorite ideas of, of designing it into the land into the architecture. Here's a um, a cistern built below, like the cistern holds the water, built below this patio uh, with tables and chairs. And um, that would be a, a beautiful solution. There are lots of um, natural ways that, that uh, water harvesting occurs. Uh, in this case, there's a dam built above the bedrock and um, it's created an area where um, soil and organic matter accumulates and and then creates a little stream. So the water is harvested in a natural way. And you can partner with natural systems by building um, contours of wood chips that will slow the water down. And this is what it looks like in the winter. And here it is in the spring in New Mexico and just abundant grasses growing there because of this simple method of slowing down the water. So my, my message is plant the rain um, and, and what rain harvest, rain water harvesting is um, basically capturing and utilizing rain as close as possible to where it falls. And, and then you can access it from its soil storage tank where it is a living sponge and enjoy it in the form of uh, shelter and food and cooling and windbreaks and all those good things. So determining your slope. Um, I know some of you aren't in Marin County, but if you are, we have a wonderful resource called marinmap.org and you can log on and um, go to uh, map viewer. And then you get a page that looks like this. And then you can search by your address and, and that um, takes you to a parcel. Then you can click on parcel and it gives you lots of information. And in our case, the information I want you to see is that it gives you the percent of slope, uh, the average. So in this case, the average of 35% um, slope. And you, you note the um, contour lines on this property, the slope is going in this direction and it's also going in that direction. So the slope average is the combination of those two areas. You can also calculate your slope. And this is not that complicated. Uh, basically, you need a couple of stakes and um, stake A and stake B, and that you measure them in inches and then um, subtract stake A. Uh, I mean, sub, excuse me, subtract stake B from stake A, and then you get um, a measurement. And that measurement is the um, run of, no, I'm sorry, that's the rise of the slope, the rise of the slope, <laughs> I'm getting tired here. The run of the slope is the distance from stake A to stake B. And the rise is um, the, um, the measurement that I gave you 40 um, divided by the run, which is 180 multiplied by 100, and that will give you the slope percentage. And I'm sorry, I kind of messed that up, but this presentation will be archived. So if I'm going 
too fast or too slow, you can always go back. Um, so my other advice is whenever possible, don't disturb your canyon hillsides and especially know your soil types and the slope before moving forward with any disturbance. And if, if you don't know what you're doing, seek the advice of a licensed engineer or landscape architect, somebody, somebody with a license before grading or capturing rainwater because uh, you don't want to destroy the ecosystems that are there. So um, this, is, this is a diagram of, of what you can expect when you're planting a, a slope. If it's less than 25%, vegetation success is very good. And um, a little bit beyond 25%. And up to 33%, um, you can do pretty well. You, you have fair success of vegetation. Once you get higher than that, um, going into uh, moving towards the 50%, your, your chances of revegetation are, are poor. Um, this is okay to build a bioswale here in that area, and you can use rocks and mulches and ornamental grasses. And then if you get any higher than that, like 50%, it's really improbable uh, that you're going to have a successful revegetation without an engineered approach like a, a compost blanket. Um, so this is this is what a compost blanket looks like. It's you've seen them. Um, they allow water to penetrate through to the underlying soil, and they they can be seeded with um, with uh, plants so that they can grow right there. Um, and what they do is they retain loose soil and debris, and they prevent erosion. Or you can try an engineered solution. These are these are very extreme engineered solutions, but. I think they make my point, but uh, know your slope. And um, another way to approach this is uh, if you if you don't have a, a real steep slope, that this this slope is about um, 30, 35, 33 to thirty five percent slope here. Um, divide it into sections, and I mean manageable sections, because if you're just thinking about the whole thing, it's like overwhelming. So in this case, there was an upper house and a lower house that needed to be connected. And so, um, and it was covered with invasive um, grass. And, and even though it's pretty in the spring, it looked horrible in the winter. So this was the, I did this landscape. So the, the sections were divided into um, three main parts here, and then the one over here, and then a new little garden and another little seating area. And this is a brand new garden, so everything hasn't filled in, but I can tell you it, saw, it, it, it uh, was a proof of concept because all the mulch stayed in place, there was no erosion and it worked and it kept the water on the property. So that was the reason for doing it. So everyone has a different site and how you assess that is, is really important. Um, the first thing to do is find north. <laughs> and um, I am always surprised to learn how many people never knew their smartphone had a compass on it. And if you have one, um, look, it may not be in the same place as mine was when I took this photo, but find the compass and open it up and it will tell you uh, your elevation and your coordinates and it will give you a compass and you'll, it'll help you find north. So the reason that's important is because many plants grow better on certain sides of a hill than others. So if you know what, what side your hillside's facing, that will be help you and that will help inform you as to the type of plants you, you want to buy. You also want to think about what climate zone you're in. And this can be confusing because there's different systems in play here. The USDA has climate zones based on uh, winter minimum temperatures and the ability of plant to withstand frost and low temperatures. So if you see um, a plant rating with numbers in the lower digits, like not the teens, it's probably calculated by the USDA system. Um, there's another system that the American Horticultural Society uses, which isn't 
as much in play, but it calculates um, zones based on heat and the average numbers of days above 86 degrees. The system that many Californians use is the sunset system because it's so specific to our environment and it's based on a broad range of factors, including cold, heat, humidity, wind, proximity to the ocean and the length of the growing season. So I do think this is a great um, resource to use because it has lots of plants. It's not the only one and uh, doesn't list all the native plants, but it does give you a lot of information on plants that work in a certain area. Um, in Marin, we are primarily in um, the 15, 16, and 17 zones for the sunset climate zones. Um, and all of, all of our climate is characterized by the Mediterranean climate, which is long dry summers and short cooler winters. But we have like hundreds of microclimates. And again, you have to pay attention to your microclimate. Um, and these are microclimates are affected by the hills and the hollows and the slope of your property. And um, you might want to note that on a plan. And you know where where are the frost pockets? Um, and observe your microclimates during the daytime and also seasonally to note where um, the sun is at any particular time of day. Uh, microclimates are also influenced by the um, uh, wind. And so if the wind, if you have a lot of wind, wind can damage plants. Um, and uh, if, or if you have a slope and there's a frost pocket at the bottom, all of that, those kinds of decisions, I mean, those kinds of situations are going to influence your decisions on what plants to, to purchase. You also want to think a lot about what plants to keep and what to get rid of. Um, and there, there are websites um, that will help you with this. Plant, Plantright.org is, is a good one, and it will help you know what invasive plants to avoid, to avoid um, things like Mexican feathergrass and um, French broom. Those are plants that grow, that have been planted and grow a lot around here. And then you want to also want to remove flammable things um, that have a lot of oil in them, like eucalyptus, or they have a lot of leaves like bamboo. And um, I think you've all heard the fire lectures, so I'm going to move on. Edible but invasive. This was the, the um, garden that I showed you earlier and you know what plants are invasive because this little plant started out as a small patch and then it it grew and grew and grew and it was a it is edible it's a leek but um the it's a bulb and so to to get this out of the property it's like buried a it's like a foot deep into the ground so I know there are people who have different opinions on this, but in this case, the only way to control these weeds was with weed cloth. And um, not always the best solution, but in this case, it, it was the only way to, to, to stop this. Um, hydrozones are another way to think about your um, where to plant things and um, what to plant together, because each hydrozone has the same type of, has the plants with the same type of water requirements. And this will ensure that your irrigation is not wasted because you're watering a plant that needs a lot of water with uh, a lot of water and then drowning the plant that is drought tolerant. So you've got to know which plants like to live together. And this also um, leads into the topic of having efficient irrigation and smart meters and um, how to irrigate your plants so that um, they can survive when there isn't enough water. And that's a whole nother lecture, so I'm going to keep moving on. So what I encourage you to do is plant gardens with function. And the trends in landscape design are that you, that you plant uh, things with a purpose, um, meaning things that are beneficial to um, native, I mean, to pollinators and in, insects and birds and people, things you can eat, uh, medicinals. So the trend is to, um, especially in California, 
is to have um, gardens that are are not as densely planted, and um, they're planted um, not just for aesthetics, but they're they're planted for ecological restoration. So here are a few plants that I did choose for this talk that are natives and grow well in uh, Northern California. So the California buckeye is um, a tree that um, is very well designed because it, it drops its leaves right before the fire season. <laughs> and uh, then it brings them back in the spring with these lovely pink flowers. Um, it also is pretty as it becomes a tree. In other words, the bushes will have little pink flowers on them too. So it's, it's a tree that has um, value in all stages of its development. Um, and the manzanita tree on the right is also a beautiful um, op option for um, if you're planting trees on your hillside. There's another um, type of tree that um, I would also recommend that I don't have a slide of, and it's referred to as a strawberry tree. Um, or it also is called Arbutus marina or Arbutus uh, menziensi. And it has little um, white flowers that also turn into red fruits that are edible. Um, so those also are good tree choices for land, uh, hillside landscapes. And they're both, they're all natives. Um, shrubs, um, these are, are, are not all shrubs, technically. Um, some of them are just low growing um, uh, herbaceous plants. Um, the toyon is is truly a shrub, um, and it uh, the story behind that is uh, the reason it, the other name for it is California holly is because it was growing all over the Hollywood Hills when they were developing Hollywood, and they thought it was holly, but it's not. It's toyon. So, but it somehow um, got the name California holly. Um, another native, California fuchsia, grows prolifically, and it's an evergreen, and it it will um, do nicely in on a hillside, and it's very drought tolerant. Also, California buckwheat, and I have the Latin names here too, um, is a is a great native plant um, that grows well here. And these are all slope stabilizing, low maintenance, drought tolerant habitat plants that will host many insects. Grasses are also a beautiful um, solution for a hillside. And I've listed a few here that are good for our Northern California environment. Uh, uh, Muhlenbergia rigens, deer grass is in the top left. Um, and behind it is um, a ceanothus plant, which is in its large form, uh, conthus is the um, specific variety, also referred to as wild lilac. So combining grasses with um, native plants that like our environment is, is a beautiful way to, to landscape your hillside. Needlegrass on the right is another good choice and red fescue, festuca rubra, these are all good replacements for any kind of invasive species like Mexican feather grass. And combining different kinds of grasses is also a beautiful solution. Some of these um, plants, like the Archistophilus, which was in the, I showed you in a tree form, also is a ground cover form. Uh, but you have to pay attention to the last part of the um, Latin name because uva ursi is different than, I'm going to go back, uh, oh, this was an Archistophilus. Um, but anyway, there's, I'm sorry, I said the wrong thing, but there, just pay attention to the whole name. Archistophilus uva ursi is different than some of the other Manzanita versions that you can get that turn into trees or bushes. Um, Ceanothus also comes in a uh, creeping form, uh, but be sure you know which one it is because uh, if you're expecting a creeping ground cover and it turns into a bush that is six feet high, you won't be happy about that. 
um, many types of sylvia, salvias, sorry, salvias are appropriate for hillside landscaping. This one I noted uh, black sage because it is particularly um, good for um, um, roots into the hillside and establishing um, roots. So just note that you know some of the same um, types of plants, uh, Ceanothus or Archistophilus will have many forms that will all be suitable. So the, and I didn't talk at all about succulents because, um, but those are also great um, solutions for plants. But the uh, main thing is to observe your existing environmental conditions, research the plant types and their needs and group plants by water, sun and soil needs and experiment. You know, uh, don't be afraid to move a plant if it's not happy or eliminate it if, it, if it's not working. So uh, plant solutions, not problems, and build on the successes of the natural patterns and change what isn't working and hopefully live in balance with the natural system so that it will do the work and you will have less work to do because you're building resiliency into the system. So a couple of other things to note, anticipate change, um, note the, the mature height of your plant before you plant it. So you, you aren't planting uh, an oak tree and thinking it's just a little weed. Um, note seasonal change. And it's also very nice to organize your garden so that you have seasonal changes and plant things that will bloom at different times of the year. This is that same property. Um, where I had I showed you the hillside um, slopes, and here it is in the springtime with um, daffodils and narcissus um, below the um, olive trees and some um, lavender and grasses. So each season the landscape changes, and it's uh, we can observe the recreation of life. So if you do this. You learn where the water comes from, where it goes, and, and we are much more connected to the process, which is dynamic, and the benefit is free water. So I am almost done, and I'd like to just spend a few moments talking about the Watershed Approach to Landscaping program, which you uh, can sign up at. Uh, now we have our, we're taking registrations for spring classes, which begin in April at marincommunityad.com, and our classes are sponsored by Marin Water. And um, just briefly, we break uh, a booklet down, which is provided by Marin Water. We break it down into more snackable portions. Um, uh, starting with design inspiration, moving with designing your home landscape, um, then moving into designing your garden as a mini ecosystem. And go. I go into much more detail than I did in this lecture on all of these topics. We also bring in experts from the water district who will be guest lecturers for teaching the irrigation class. Um, and uh, we have other teachers teaching planning for marine gardens and um, uh, building healthy soils in your garden will be taught by uh, the person who runs the garden, uh, excuse me, the farm at College of Marin and very knowledgeable people. So these are these are two hour, two and a half hour classes on Saturdays. So um, they're filling up. So if you're interested, um, take a look and sign up. And I also want to thank, again, our, our sponsor, uh, one of our sponsors, um, Marin Water. And they are 100% locally sourced, and they're California's oldest munis municipal water district. And they are very committed to preserving the 22,000 acres of watershed land um, around Mount Tam and West Marin, which hopefully all of you have experienced and enjoy. So I'm grateful to Marin Water as our sponsor and their education programs. They have lots of things available to their customers. Um, the education and outreach is available to everyone. And I have a resource slide 
um, with a few of the things I mentioned or or didn't mention, but Cal Calscape is an excellent place to re research um, types of native plants that work in your area. Wu Calls is part of UC Davis, and they use a water use classification system that will um, help you understand uh, plant water use within your city or region. Uh, this is the Watershed Approach to Landscaping series, which I already talked about, and then the booklet, which is the, the textbook uh, provided free of charge to the students, is also available in PDF form on the Marin Water website, and you can access it by going to Marin Water um, and this, these prompts. And then also, if you're a Marin County resident and you want to look at your parcel map, that's marinmap.org. And last but not least, to thank our sponsor, Sloat Garden Center, and all the resources that they provide and um, the, the help with choosing plants specific to your landscape. I know they're very committed to that. They have a lot of native plants that they sell. So I am very supportive of the effort that they make in this community. So I am open for questions and there's only five minutes. I'll stay longer if you have them. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for your time and attention. And I hope to meet you in your garden someday. Oh, thanks so much, Talia. This was really incredible. I loved the flow of the presentation and all the information that you presented. It was really uh, thorough and amazing to the point we don't have any questions <laughs> uh, but I have a okay. question well first of yes. all I was going to show and and I've done this before this is my sunset western garden book I don't know if you can see it but I really? I use it so much that the binding like I need to duct tape the binding that's I mean and we have, you know, we have like computers now and Google searches and stuff like that, but I'm always looking in that book. So that's a really good uh, resource. And then Calscape, I love too. Um, but I mentioned, oh, oh, go ahead. Um, I wanted to mention that if you're buying the uh, Sunset book, be sure to get the latest edition. And the one that is the latest edition that I'm aware of is the one with the photo. Uh, I had a photo of it uh, in an earlier slide. Which okay. I think was still like 2009, maybe, or 2012. I mean, they haven't made one in a long time. But yeah, I, I've got all the editions. Um, but this one, for whatever reason, I this is right next to me. Um, what I was going to ask is, <clears throat> and this comes up for me just as a designer, but <clears throat> if somebody has a hillside and they go and plant it with a bunch of plants, how long can you anticipate? it's gonna take before the plants are gonna be able to hold in that hillside adequately in terms of erosion? <clears throat> um, Does it depend on the plant or, you know, do you have like a general rule? I don't think there's a general rule um, because it's there's so many factors. Um, I mean, the plants that I included in this presentation, some of them aren't that fast growing, but once they're established, they're really solid there. So um, I don't know if speed is the um, is the the right way to think about it. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how to I think it's it's it there is no easy answer to that one to be honest with you. Agreed. And I think it does have to do with the, and then also like the size of plant that you start out with, obviously. But um, I guess for me, I usually say eight to 12 months just mm -hmm. until the plant gets established because then you know that the roots have sort of spread out and are taking hold in the hillside. I don't know. Um, well, for, I cannot and respond to that from another perspective um, mm -hmm. from native plants that are very low water use, you still need to irrigate them in the beginning till they get, if we have a dry summer to get them started. And I have heard landscapers say um, two summers before you stop the irrigation, like two complete mm. summers of giving the plant the moisture it needs and then it's, it's established. So that's a little bit longer mm -hmm. than your timeline. Um, yeah, that makes so sense. It, no, but it's hard to say. It's, I, I don't think there's an easy answer. Um, 
I do want to say, because somebody asked, this is being recorded. I, I guess I didn't mention that earlier. So this is being recorded and it will be available on our website under the learn tab and then videos this Friday, which is the 10th. And then also on our uh, YouTube. So if you subscribe to our YouTube, you'll get a notification when the recording is up. And it's great because you can rewind and pause and screenshot and things like that. Um, a couple more questions because we are nearing nearing the, the end of the hour. And I know it, it, Wednesday people want to go make dinner. Um, so if you uh, can you talk a little bit about the creation of ponds to hold water with an escape path for water to slow it down the hillside and let it sink in? Yes, um, although I did notice on your um, list of topics that you have a presentation on rain gardens. Mm -hmm. And that basically is what this is. It's a rain garden. So um, I would say um, some of the rules of thumb are, this, are some of the same guidelines that were earlier in my presentation for pathways is that you want them, you know, 10 feet away from your house. They're shallow. They're not intended to be ponds. They're just intended to hold the water when it rains. So the planting around them is geared towards that. So you, mm. you would plant um, things that don't mind getting their feet wet, like um, rushes and um, grasses in the base. And then up the slope, you could plant um, things that like a medium amount of water. And then at the top, you plant um, things that are not liking as much water. So it, it's... Um, but keep in mind, you know, these are these are like um, flash flood holders, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, they're not ponds. And that's it's a it's a change in how people think of shaping their landscape. Um, and, a, and a pond uh, or a, um, a rain garden isn't appropriate for every every property. It's not that appropriate for hillsides. It's more appropriate for flat properties. But if you have a more of a gentle hillside that and you can see putting a rain garden in there, um, you can do it. But keep in mind, you know, it's it's a temporary storage solution. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question, but there is uh, we do go more into creating rain gardens in our classes. So um, and I think, as I said, your other lecture. Well, yeah, and I think it, to your point with one of your earlier slides where it's it just, you know, it's sort of slowing down that that water and, and what you can plant, you know, how you can maximize it along how, however you're having it drain out. So just thinking about that in terms of your planting. Right. Um, what are good plants for a shady northern slope? Oh, no. Am I getting uh -huh. a specific question? Uh -huh. um, I'm not going to answer that. I want you to do your work. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Go to Kalski um, and yeah, put in Kalski. shade, uh, what do you put, shade, ground cover, or whatever you want, tree, or like it's got an incredible search engine. Yes. Um, yes. How tall you want it, if you want a flower color, if you want to attract a bird, whatever, you can put that in. Um, yes. Okay, well, this has been incredible. I, I really appreciate your time and expertise. There's a lot of great information here, and I'm really glad to have this partnership with Marin Water and College of Marin, and I hope that we can do future classes together. I think that would be really fun. Uh, thanks, everybody else, for joining us. And like I said, the recording will be available this Friday, both on our website and on our YouTube channel. And please do look at our upcoming classes because we do have a lot more planned for this month. And then after March, we're gonna scale back uh, in terms of quantity of classes. And so sort of sort of get them while they're, while they're here because there's like a lot of really good information to prepare you for the growing season. So thanks a lot. I hope everybody has a wonderful Wednesday evening. And thanks again, uh, Talia. I really appreciate your, your time and everything that you had to present. Have a good night. Thank you.